Our presentation tonight is titled Power Plant Resurrection. And our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated, uh, an offer for just numerous aviation publications, holds a certified flight instructor certificate, uh, A&P mechanic certificate with the inspection authorization privileges. In 2008, he was the Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year with the FAA and a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. Good evening, everybody. I hope you enjoy this slide. I worked very hard on this image. <laughs> <laughs> Good we're, one, Mike. <laughs> we're going to be, uh, we're going to be, it's entitled Power Plant Resurrection. We're going to be talking about bringing aircraft engines back to life. This is not exactly how you do it, but it's, uh, I thought it was a, a good image. The problem that we're going to be addressing tonight is the fact that um, piston aircraft engines just hate to sit unflown. Um, it's not good for them. Uh, the problem is that during lengthy periods of disuse, the protective oil film that normally coats uh, all of the, the, the moving parts in the engine, particularly ferrous metal parts, uh, that oil film gradually strips off, um, you know, gravity sets in. And as the, uh, as the oil film strips off, it exposes critical surfaces to uh, the risk of corrosion pitting. Um, the surfaces that we're most worried about are uh, steel cylinder walls, um, cam lobes, and uh, tappet faces. We don't worry too much about uh, uh, bearings about uh, about uh, crankshaft kernels and and um, um, crank pins and stuff because they have bearings around them that are holding the oil captive and so it tends to stay in place for a long time but the surfaces that are that are exposed as opposed to being held captive by a bearing um, are the ones that are vulnerable uh, to corrosion when the engine sits for a while because they are totally dependent on this uh, film of oil to protect them uh, against the ravages of, of environment and time. So um, the, the, the oil will strip off, uh, the, the, some corrosion will start, and then afterwards, when the engine is finally started again without any lubrication in there, uh, it's what we refer to as a dry start, um, the surfaces can suffer abnormal friction and wear. Uh, this is a picture of a cam uh, that has obvious um, corrosion distress and uh, spalling, and uh, it looks like the lifter down below it um, also has some uh, some issues starting on it. This is a intake cam lobe that's shared uh, by two cylinders, so there's a tappet on each side of it. But this is the kind of problem that uh, that we worry about when engines sit unflown. Now, unfortunately, this problem of uh, of, of engines um, uh, going for long periods of time not being used is one that's very common. Um, I know it, it, it happened to me not that long ago. Um, my uh, airplane went uh, into the hangar for its annual in November of uh, 2018. And my intention was to get it back in the air within a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, I wound up getting hit by a nasty virus that kept me in bed and messed up my entire schedule. And by the time the airplane got annual got signed off and I got to fly it again, uh, it wasn't until the end of February. So the poor engine sat there for, for four months unflown. And like a lot of things, it, this wasn't a planned event, so I couldn't take the precautionary measures that one would like to take of, you know, putting pickling oil in and putting desiccant spark plugs in and maybe hooking up an engine dehumidifier and stuff. It, it just, you know, I just kind of dropped out of sight because I got sick and things like that happen. Um, I was contacted a while back by uh, an owner who had just bought a uh, Shrike Commander 
um, and it had been sitting unflown in a hangar in Oregon for 14 years. And he was, uh, he called to ask me for advice about how to bring this, this airplane back to life. And, and that, that call actually is what gave me the idea of, uh, of, uh, of, of doing this webinar. Uh, I had another call from an owner of a, uh, who was building a, an RV and um, he was a little bit over optimistic as to what his completion uh, schedule was going to be. So he ordered this uh, brand new Lycoming experimental engine and then turned out he wasn't ready for it. And it sat uh, without being run uh, for, for about a year. Um, and again, he was looking for advice as to what the best thing to do to, uh, to try to minimize damage uh, to the engine when it was started. So that was really what what prompted the idea of of uh, of doing uh, this webinar. And um, obviously, the best thing is to not let let this happen. Either fly the engine frequently, or or pickle it so that it doesn't uh, sustain any corrosion problems. But that doesn't isn't always possible. So, uh, what's the best thing to do? Well, the the, the real key to resurrecting an engine that sat sat around for a while is pre-lubrication. Um, we we want to get oil on on everything in that engine that we possibly can before we before we we crank it. Um, unfortunately, our engines are not designed to make this particularly easy. Um, but there are some some ways that we can uh, that we can can get things oiled up and I wanted to offer some ideas and some recommendations in that regard. Um, the first thing we want to worry about pre-lubricating are the cylinders. And um, the, the way I recommend doing that is to remove all the spark plugs, rotate the prop to bring each piston to bottom dead center, and then spray um, a, a fine mist of uh, penetrating lubricant into each cylinder through the spark plug holes. Um, I like to use a, a pump up sprayer. This, this, this one solo 418 is 16 bucks on Amazon. It's really designed to mist plants and it's got an adjustable nozzle that, that lets you go from a stream to a very fine mist. And what we're really looking for is a very fine mist of oil uh, squirted into the uh, into the combustion chamber so that it will drift around and settle on every every possible surface. Um, so I, I recommend a sprayer like this and then a thin penetrating oil. Uh, several uh, good uh, oils that you can use. Um, a croil made by Cano, uh, croil or aero croil, um, LPS2, uh, two corrosion preventative uh, oils that are that are specifically designed to be to create a very fine mist or ACF 50 and corrosion X. Any of those will do a good job of, of, of turning into a fog when you when you spray them at high pressure using a using a pump up sprayer like this. And that's what we're really looking for. We're looking to fog a, a mist, a very fine mist of oil into the cylinders so that it will drift around and, and settle on, on all the surfaces. So, um, so that's, that's really the, uh, the first step. We wanna, we wanna fog oil into the cylinders. Then the next thing that we wanna do is try to do a similar thing uh, in the crankcase. We wanna fog a fine mist of oil into the crankcase so that hopefully some of that fog will settle on the cam lobes and, and the, the things that they're worried about down there. Now, how you, how you accomplish that kind of depends uh, from engine to engine, but typically you can, you can uh, put a fog of, of fine penetrating oil into the crankcase, either through the oil filler cap or through the engine breather tube uh, uh, fitting. Um, and if you have easy access to both, it doesn't hurt to, 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 um, to, to fog oil into both of them. 
Um, some oil fillers uh, don't really work for this. Um, this this engine that is in the picture is a, what's called a sand cast type continental engine, um, like a Cessna 182 engine. And it's real easy to fog stuff in through the oil filler. Um, the engines in my airplane are in a Bonanza, which are what are called permold style continentals. The oil filler just doesn't work for this because it goes to the wrong place. Uh, and so we, we would fog it into the breather. Um, so it depends on, um, on which, uh, what engine you have, what the best orifice to get stuff into the crankcase. But what we want to do is, is spray a very, very fine mist of oil. Uh, it's like a fog of penetrating oil into the crankcase and try to get make it fine enough that it will drift around and settle on as 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 much uh, of the surfaces in there as possible. Um, once we've done fogged oil into the cylinders and fogged oil into the crankcase, the next thing we want to do is make sure that the 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 bearings and other pressure lubricated portions of the uh, engine are well lubricated. And the way to do that is with the spark plugs still removed because we removed them to fog oil into the cylinders. We want to crank the engine with a starter in 30 second bursts because the starters typically are intermittent duty motors that, that uh, aren't supposed to be run for more than 30 seconds at a time without cooling off. Um, so crank the engine with the starter with the spark plugs removed so that there's no compression so that the starter can spin the engine re reasonably rapidly and and keep doing this in 30 second bursts until you start to see oil pressure register on the oil pressure gauge in the cockpit um, and once you get to the point where you can see oil pressure registering um, you know that all of the oil galleries are full and that oil has been pumped into the main and rod bearings and prop governor and other places that that it that it needs to be that are that are pressure lubricated uh, by by the uh, the the oil system of the engine um once you've done that you've pretty much done all the pre-lubrication that's possible to do so it's time to reinstall the spark plugs and while you're at it uh, check them out make sure they're clean make sure they're gapped properly um, uh, adjust them if necessary uh, use a new copper gasket or a neely old copper gasket uh, when you reinstall the spark plug. And um, at this point, the engine should be ready to run. I, I want to point out that everything that we've talked about so far uh, it qualifies as preventive maintenance that an owner is allowed to do without any kind of a and supervision if it's a certificated airplane. Of course, if it's an experimental airplane, you can pretty much do anything you want to it. But all of this is stuff is is stuff that an owner is allowed to do without getting uh, getting an A and P involved. Um, so now it's time to pull the airplane out of the hangar or and and uh, and start the engine for the first time. Uh, and when we start the engine the first time after a long period of disuse, we've 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 got to take some precautions to minimize the possibility of dry start damage. Um, one of the things we don't want to do is do uh, very much priming because we've worked real hard to fog a film of oil onto the cylinder walls and we really don't want to wash it off with fuel. So use minimum priming. Um, also, because the, the first time you start the engine, it may be a little harder to start than usual. Uh, be cautious that you don't uh, crank the starter for more than 30 seconds at a time without giving the starter a cool off period. Uh, we've, we've seen a lot of people burn up starters and sometimes even worse, burn up uh, things like starter contactors and so on, but by cranking uh, excessively without giving the system a, an opportunity to cool down. Um, once you get the engine started, you want to, resist the uh, urge to, to rev it up. You, you want to make sure you start it and, and keep it at minimum idle, which for most of these engines is somewhere around six to 800 RPM. 
and let it idle uh, at that minimum RPM uh, for a couple minutes until you're sure that uh, everything inside the uh, crankcase that is splash lubricated has has got had a chance to get a thorough um, splashing of oil, a thorough lubrication. Um, once uh, you've given a little chance to do that, you can you can cautiously start to throttle up the engine to higher RPM, but do it slowly and cautiously. The the stress on the cam to tap it interface in particular rises very very sharply with RPM. It's uh, it's it's much more than a linear relationship, and so as you're revving up the engine, it's putting um, a, a lot more stress on the cam to tap it interface. You want to make sure that that's very thoroughly lubricated before you uh, before you throttle up, um, and uh, uh, so just be cautious about that. Um, once you've completed this and uh, the engine is uh, thoroughly warmed up and it seems to be operating properly and you've made sure that everything is as lubricated as it's possible to be, uh, you may feel ready to go for the first flight with this revived engine. I won't go into a lot of detail about that, but my recommendation on the first flight um, after an engine has been resurrected like this is to treat it as if you're breaking in new cylinders, which means basically run it really hard for about an hour. Uh, they're, they're, you you want to scrape rust off the cylinder walls. You want to uh, uh, maybe reseat the rings a little bit. Um, and uh, so, so run, run it hard for the first hour. Uh, warm it up slowly. Rev it up slowly, but once once you've completed that process, fly it as if you're uh, as if you're breaking in cylinders. Now, so far I haven't talked about inspecting the inside of the engine for damage, and that, that's kind of intentional. The the reason I haven't is because if you go stick a bore scope in the in the cylinders after an engine's been sitting for a long time, you're almost certain to see. Uh, you know, at least light rust on the cylinder walls. Um, what you don't know, and you can't really tell, is is how much damage that rust has done. How wh whether the whether it's just uh, um, surface rust that's going to get scraped off the first time you run the engine, or or whether there's deeper corrosion pitting uh, uh, in the cylinders that that you're worried about. Um, so my recommendation is to uh, is to do your bore scope inspection, but to do it after uh, the first run of the engine, preferably after the first flight. Um, you can check out the cylinders with a with a cheap um, bore scope. I use this Vividia VA four hundred Able scope, which is less than two hundred bucks on Amazon. It's a very good scope. Uh, it you hook it to your PC or you can hook it to your your tablet or phone or whatever. It doesn't have its own display, but it's got a USB connector that you can plug into pretty much anything and 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 look at the images and capture the images and stuff. Um, so you want to bore scope the cylinder walls, make sure that there's not excessive corrosion pitting or vertical scoring that might suggest uh, you know a broken compression ring or something. You want to take a look at how much crosshatch is visible on the cylinder walls, which gives you a good idea of how worn they are. Um, probably want to take a look at the at the exhaust valves, make sure they look symmetric and that they're not starting to burn. Um, we did a whole webinar on boroscopy with lots of pictures, so I won't go into detail. But um, but my recommendation is to is to borescope the cylinders after the 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 first run of the engine and preferably after the first flight because you'll be able to tell a lot more than if you try to bore scope it dry. Um, you'd also like to take a look at the cam and lifters, of course, but um, that may be uh, easy or it may be very difficult depending on what engine you have. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the easiest engines uh, to, to take a look at with the bore scope 
uh, inside the crankcase are the Continental Sandcast style engines. That these are the Continental engines that have an oil cooler up on the front and a belt-driven alternator on the rear, like a Cessna 182, for example. Uh, they have got this nice oil filler right up on top of the crank case that, that just opens a something like a half inch hole <laughs> that you can stick a bore scope down and look around. Um, and you can actually even use a, a rigid bore scope uh, and get a pretty good view, although flexible bore scopes are, you, you can see more, but you can get a pretty good look down in there uh, just by sticking a bore scope in the oil filler cap. The Permold style Continentals, uh, like uh, in my uh, twin Cessna or Bonanzas and so on. Those are the ones with an alternator up front and the oil cooler in the back. Uh, they're more difficult because the oil filler uh, is off to the side of the engine instead of on top and it doesn't give you a port to, to look down into the crankcase. So if you really want to take a look at the cam and lifters, the easiest way on, on one of these engines is to remove the alternator. Uh, that's that's up at the front of the engine. You can see it in the picture. And when you remove the alternator, you you, you open up a big giant hole, eight inch diameter hole in the side of the crankcase and you can go in there with a bore scope and see lots and lots of stuff. Um, if you have a thin flexible bore scope, it is also possible to avoid taking off the alternator because on the opposite side of the front of the crankshaft from the alternator, is a seventh eighth inch uh, plug, a timing plug. And you can pull that timing plug and work a, a thin flexible bore scope uh, in, into that plug and through the, uh, uh, the ring gear that drives the alternator and, and take a look in the back. But the easiest way, uh, especially if you don't have an exotic bore scope, is to pull the alternator. And that brings us to light combings. Light combings are very, very difficult to, uh, to to, to bore scope inside. In fact, most mechanics will tell you it's not possible. It, it is possible, but it's not easy. What you have to do is, is remove the oil sump. And once you remove the oil sump, you will see a couple of slots down at the bottom of the, of the crankcase that were covered up by the, uh, by the oil sump. And you can see that in the lower picture. And then you need a very thin, very flexible bore scope that you can work up through those slots um, past the, the, the crankshaft throws and up towards the top where, where you would see the cam and lifters. And to do that, you need a bore scope that is uh, less than six millimeters in diameter. Most of the inexpensive ones are, are, are eight or 10 millimeters. Uh, this, uh, a Vividia VA350 will do the job nicely. It's $570 on Amazon, so it's a little bit more than uh, than the cheap one that we were talking about. But um, uh, th that's the kind of bore scope you would need in order to uh, to be able to uh, look at the, uh, the the cam and lifters and the light combing, and even then. You're only going to see, I'll go back to the previous slide, you're only going to see the, the rear few lobes of the cam. You won't, it's just, there's no way to, to see the front lobes of the cam just because of the way the engine is built. But you, it, with a, a thin flexible bore scope, you actually can look at the rear three cam lobes um, and get an idea of what those, what those look like. But it is, it is a bit of a challenge and you need a, a, a good thin flexible bore scope to do it. Um, or in the alternative, you can not bore scope the, uh, the, the crankcase. You can just fly the engine and, uh, check the, uh, the drain the oil and, and, and check the oil filter, uh, frequently every 25 hours or so looking for the presence of ferrous metal. And if you do that and you get through about a hundred hours and you don't see any ferrous metal, you can be pretty sure that you dodged the bullet. Uh, and that the, uh, the, the cam and lifters are okay. Um, cam and lifters, um, the, the corrosion damage to cam and lifters is, is not what I consider a safety of flight issue. Uh, nobody's ever fallen out of the sky because they had spalled cam and lifters. Uh, it's, it's what I call a safety of wallet issue. It's very expensive, of course, because you got to tear down the engine to replace the cam and lifters. Um, or at least the cam. 
Uh, you have to tear down a Lycoming to replace the lifters. Most of the Continentals, you can replace the lifters from the outside, but the cam always requires a tear down. Um, so it's a safety of wallet item, but it's not really a safety of flight item. So I think it's perfectly responsible to, to just fly the airplane and watch the filter very closely. And if you don't see uh, ferrous metal developing in the filter or a significant amount of it, uh, and you get through the first hundred hours, you can be pretty confident that the uh, the cam and lifters weren't weren't uh, seriously damaged. So with that, Tim, that's uh, that's about all the prepared material I have. But I would be happy to open it up for Q and A. Okay, Mike, we've got some questions that have already come in here. Let's jump into them then. So first one, um, let's see here. Chris is wondering how long can an engine sit before it cannot be resurrected in this way and needs to be rebuilt? Any rule of thumb? It's, you, you can't, it's, it's a really an unanswerable question because there are so many factors involved. Um, you know, if, if the airplane is is uh, is sitting in a hangar in Tucson, Arizona. It could probably sit there for 20 years and still be okay. <laughs> uh, if it's if it's sitting in South Florida, uh, it might be toast after six months. It's just there's so much variability in terms of um, of environmental risk as to where the airplane is spending its inactive time. There's also issues of of whether the airplane was hangered or not um, of whether it was using um, uh, oil that had that has uh, corrosion preventative additives in there, uh, or something like CamGuard, which will will help inhibit corrosion and will allow the engine to sit for a longer time before damaging uh, corrosion sets in. Um, uh, you know, the engine could have been in South Florida, but if it was hooked to a good engine dehumidifier, dehumidifier like a Black Max or something like that, it could probably sit for 20 years and nothing bad would happen to it. Um, but typically, the engines that we're worried about resurrecting are, are ones that went inactive without anybody taking uh, precautions to uh, to hook up a dehumidifier or to put pickling oil in the engine and so on. So there, there are just a lot of variables um, in terms of uh, how long before uh, uh, serious damage occurs. And so it's, it's a really hard question to answer. Ralph is wondering, what's the difference between a penetrating oil and just plain oil? Um, a penetrating oil is, is very thin and, it, and it's designed to creep uh, rather than to sit where you where you put it, uh, and we're looking for a very fine oil that we can that we can spray in there as a very fine mist that almost looks like smoke or something like that. Um, the 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 two corrosion preventative substances that I mentioned, uh, Corrosion X and, and uh, ACF fifty, are are particularly designed for for fogging. And so they would they would make quite good choices for this. That we're we have limited access, and we're trying to get oil to go everywhere. So our best shot at doing that, since we can't really apply it directly, is to use a very light oil that we can mist into into the uh, into the area to the combustion chamber or the crankshaft or the crankcase, um, in in such fine droplets that they will just kind of float along, float around in there and, and, and coat everything. And that's why we want to use a pressure sprayer. We want to adjust the, the nozzle on the pressure sprayer to a very, very fine mist uh, and use a real thin oil that we can, that, that we can spray um, that way to, to, to get a, um, a high pressure fog of, of, uh, of lubricant in, in there. Jason is wondering, um, is there anything uh, special to pay attention to regarding long-term storage regarding the injection system? Oh, the fuel injection system? No, not really. Um, the fuel injection systems, I mean, tend to stay clean all by themselves. Um, you know, they've got a nice, effective uh, solvent running through them. Uh, so they, they don't really suffer from sitting. Uh, the exception of that might be something like 
<clears throat> like the RSA um, fuel servo uh, <clears throat> in fuel injected Lycomings that, that have a bunch of diaphragms in there. Uh, and I suppose if the diaphragms uh, were allowed to dry out over a long period of time, they, they might deteriorate and start to crack and so on. But I, I think it would take a long time uh, before that, before that was a problem, uh, we're really mostly worried about uh, corrosion damage, and uh, primarily ferrous metal parts that that are damaged by corrosion. And uh, Raphael was just wondering, um, what what was the time frame between the oil fogging and using the starter to spin the engine? No particular. No particular time frame. Um, I mean, you're going to work your way around the engine, doing this individually with each cylinder, um, with the piston at bottom dead center, so that the uh, the lubricant can work its way all the way down the cylinder walls, and uh, and and then fog some oil into the into the uh, crankcase as best you can, and at that point you can go ahead and and and. Uh, and and uh, and start uh, cranking it with the spark plugs out in order to get oil pressure up. Thomas is wondering, what about rubber parts, hoses, etc.? Um, well, I mean that's a good question. Um, the the, the f f flexible, flammable, fluid carrying hoses. Say that ten times quick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, are, are, are the ones we primarily worry about. Um, th there are two kinds of, of uh, flexible, flammable, fluid-carrying hoses. There are conventional rubber hoses and there are Teflon hoses. The rubber hoses, um, the recommendation is that they should be replaced uh, very conservative people say every five years, uh, less conservative people say every 10 years. Uh, and, and those kinds of hoses normally always have a date code uh, stamped on them so that you, you, you can look at the hose and figure out when, when, it was, when it was built so you know how old it is. Um, Teflon hoses, on the other hand, um, last well, pretty much forever. I mean, people call them lifetime hoses. That's probably a slight exaggeration, but they last for a very long time. So um, on an engine that's been sitting for a long time, I mean, like the commander that was sitting for 14 years, um, it, it probably would be prudent to go through the engine compartment looking for um, for flexible rubber hoses and just replace them because they're all you know, 14 years old <laughs> at least. Um, and again, you can look at the date code on the hoses and know how old they are. And a, a good IA will do that at every annual inspection and, and will recommend that if you have any hoses that are, you know, more than 10 years old or so, he's, he'll, he'll probably uh, recommend that you replace them on general principles. Gomer was wondering, did the twin, uh, did the Arrow Twin Commander engine survive the 14 years of non-use? I don't know. Unfortunately, a lot of the time when I get these inquiries, I never, I, they, they never come back to me with the punchline. And in the case of the commander, I really don't know what the outcome was. Huh. I had a lot of people uh, ask about Marvel Mr. Oil. Bruce is wondering, a lot of other people, what's your opinion of Marvel Mr. Oil? Well, first of all, it's not a mystery. Um, Marvel Mystery Oil is now owned by Turtle Wax, by the way. <laughs> and you can, uh, you can go online and get an, an MSDS uh, uh, sheet of uh, whatever they, that stands for something. Um, at any rate, you, the, the, there's, there's a, a data sheet that is required to be published by, I don't know, OSHA or the Environmental Protection Agency or somebody uh, that you can look up online and it'll tell you exactly what's, what's in Marvel Mystery Oil. Um, and basically it's a, it's a, uh, just some uh, petroleum distillate solvents and some perfume and some some red coloring. Um, it, 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 its primary benefit is as a solvent, and I, I have used it on occasion when I heard some uh, hydraulic lifters clattering uh, because uh, it, it is pretty good at, at, at freeing them up. 
Um, I don't use marble mystery oil as a, um, as a uh, routine thing, only if I notice some trouble. Uh, I know there's some people who add it to oil and some people that add it to fuel and swear by it, uh, but I've never seen any evidence that that absent something that's sticky like lifters that, that it does any particular good. It's not FAA approved, but, but I, I think it's been used since the Wright brothers. And so apparently as far as I can tell, it does no harm. So it makes you feel good to use it. I wouldn't particularly discourage it, but I, I don't, I, I, I don't do it. And I don't think that it, that there's any evidence that it, that it really helps as, as a routine thing to use Marvel mystery oil. John's wondering, uh, does a long inactivity period with an aircraft that is flowing with mo gas have greater, lesser, about the same potential for corrosion, all else being equal? I don't think there's any significant difference. I mean, if there was any difference, uh, it would be advantage mo gas because um uh lead is just horrible stuff and the the less lead we have in the fuel the 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 better um so if you have an engine that's been certified to operate on uh on un unleaded mo gas um it, if if anything it's going to make things better also if the engine is operating on unleaded mo gas you can use synthetic oil, which uh, which has a much a very superior film strength, uh, but synthetic oil doesn't work very well with leaded fuel, so we te we tend not to use it. The last fully synthetic uh, oil for piston aircraft engines was Mobil AV1, and it was pulled off the market back in the mid 90s under in a hail of uh, of class action lawsuits because it wrecked so many engines. But it, it the reason was that it didn't get a lot. It, it worked great in cars, but didn't work for it. Didn't work in airplane engines because it didn't uh, agree with the leaded fuel. Had several people asking questions about the Rotax 912 being a uh, dry sump engine, and uh, how does this information uh, pertain to them? Any recommendations for dry sump engines like that 912? The the recommendations are the same. Uh, it 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 really doesn't matter whether it's a dry sump or wet sump because we're talking about the contents of the crankcase and the contents of the you know the combustion chambers in the cylinders, and um, w whether it's a wet sump engine or dry sump engine, those components are all dry. The the oil in a wet sump engine is only down in the oil pan at the very bottom of the engine, and it doesn't. It it, uh, it it's it's not like the camshaft is running in liquid or anything like that. All all the interesting stuff is above the oil level. It's not it's not uh, bathed in oil when the engine's sitting. So there's really no difference as far as this discussion is concerned between dry sump and wet sump. And of course, same thing would be true of a dry sump engine like a like an O200 Continental and a Cessna 150. Same thing. It's got an external oil tank rather than a uh, than an oil pan but it really doesn't make any difference for purposes of this this discussion um several people asking about uh, cam guard rob's question uh, might sum it up here can cam guard be used as a preventive measure and run constantly with each oil change absolutely i i use cam guard at every oil change um, if i knew that the engine was going to be down for a while uh, I would I would put a double dose of cam guard in a 10% concentration rather than the usual 5% concentration. That that make that that makes a pretty good pickling oil uh, for uh, for for aircraft engines. Um, but yeah, no uh, something like cam guard or uh, things like Aerosol W100 plus, uh, which has a also has corrosion preventative package in there. That's that that's quite helpful for airplane for engines that sit it's not a panacea it won't you know it, it, it just helps delay uh, the onset of corrosion damage and uh, jamie's wondering is there a way to prime the oil pump directly instead of cranking with plugs out to get the pressure like homino 320 
Uh, there are ways, but it's probably not worth the hassle. Um, uh, cranking it with the starter with the spark plugs out doesn't put much strain on the starter because there's no compression that it's cranking against. And I've done that a zillion times, not only for resurrecting engines, but also things like uh, when we change a turbocharger and want to, you know, prelude the turbocharger, the new turbocharger, we, we do the same thing. We take the spark plugs out and crank the engine with the starter. And as long as you don't crank uh, for too long and let the heater and let the uh, starter uh, get too hot, uh, it's it's really not a problem. A few people have asked questions. How long do you usually wait in between those 30 second crankings for the starter to cool off before you attempt it again? I think the official politically correct answer to that question <laughs> is uh, 30 seconds on and two minutes off. I, I think that's probably a little on the conservative side. Um, I probably don't wait two minutes, but uh, I think that's the that's the officially correct answer. To 30, 30, after 30 seconds of cranking, you're supposed to let it cool off for two minutes. And uh, Malcolm's wondering, what are your thoughts on leaving a Tannis heater plugged in 24-7 during the colder months? Okay, that's a, that's a question that uh, has come up a number of times in a number of these webinars. Um, Tannis did a white paper on that subject some years ago where they did some testing. And their recommendation was that if the engine is um, purged of moisture by uh, hooking it up to a, an engine dehydrator, which is, is just a little air pump that pumps pre-dried air into the into the crankcase all the time, then it's fine to leave the heater on 24/7. Um, they they say that if the if the engine is just shut down the usual way, which means that it's all full of water, uh, that it's not a good idea to leave the heater on 24/7 um, because the Tannis heater doesn't heat the engine evenly it, it concentrates on heating the oil pan and the and the uh, cylinder heads um, but there are some cold spots in the engine that aren't heated by the tannis um, in continental engines the starter uh, the starter drive adapter is is typically the the victim and so the heater will wind up vaporizing moisture which then condenses on whatever is left that's cold uh, and uh, winds up uh, creating a lot of rust problems on, on that. Um, another thing that wasn't really addressed in the TANIS report, but uh, I, I think that if you want to leave your TANIS on 24-7 and you don't use an engine dehydrator, at the very least what you need to do is put some cow plugs in and cover the engine with a big blanket so that the heat has a chance to uh, to work its way throughout the engine compartment, not just where the heating elements are. Um, that would minimize the possibility of that sort of uh, condensation problem on, on cold spots of the engine. Um, or if you use forced air heat in, as opposed to uh, an electric heater, there's some people use a forced air heater with a, a thermostatically controlled um, hot blower that blows air into the into the engine all the time and again if you do that and and cover everything up with a blanket when cowl plugs um, then you can be pretty sure that everything in the engine compartments at the same temperature and you and and you won't have the the problem with condensation on, on cold parts wayne is wondering how long can oil sit before you should change it um, the most common recommendation on that and the, the, what we recommend to our clients is to that the oil should be changed at least three times a year, uh, regardless of hours. In other words, every four months. So what we recommend to our clients that, that who have engines with full flow uh, uh, spin on oil filters is uh, is to do the is to change the oil every 50 hours or four months, whichever comes first. So if they fly a lot, the 50 hours will come first. If they don't fly very much, the four months will come first. But we don't want oil s sitting in the engine uh, for for a year. Um, 
Francos is wondering, how effective are desiccant plugs for winter storage inside a hangar? They're very, they're very effective. Um, the desiccant plugs will keep the, um, the combustion chamber dry, uh, but we also recommend uh, uh, putting desiccant bags in the induction uh, inlet and in the exhaust um, to, um, uh, to absorb uh, moisture that's outside the cylinders. And, uh, but yeah, they're, they're quite effective and it's a really good idea to do that. Cool. Maury's wondering, uh, Maury's wondering, back after 911, a large portion of the GA fleet sat idle for one plus months. Some folks took the step of taxiing around for 15 or 20 minutes during this time. Would this step be a suitable mitigation or not so much? Well, it's a mixed blessing to do that. Um, it, you know, it, 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 it helps in one way and it hurts another way. It helps in that it reestablishes the protective oil film, and, and that's certainly important. It hurts in that every time you run the engine, uh, you create a, a, a big bolus of moisture in, inside the, the crank case. It's and the moisture, it's not environmental moisture. Um, when, when you burn uh, 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 petroleum, uh, you generate uh, carbon dioxide and H2O. <laughs> uh, and the most of that H2O that is created in the combustion process and most of the CO2 that's created in the combustion process uh, goes out the exhaust pipe, but some of it goes past the compression rings and winds up in the crankcase. So every time you run the engine, you, you're essentially injecting water into the engine. And if you keep doing that over and over and over again, you, you, you keep building up the amount of moisture in the engine more and more and more. The way we get rid of that moisture typically is to go fly the, the engine where we get oil temperature up high enough um, and crankcase pressure high enough that the moisture uh, uh, gets vaporized and then the, the, the crankcase pressure forces it out the breather. And that's how the engine is normally purged of moisture. If you're just running it on the ground, you're not going to get the either either the oil temperature or the crankcase pressure sufficient to do that. So, you know, w the only solution in say a 911 situation where you simply can't fly it would be to uh, get rid of the moisture with a with an engine dehydrator. And there are a couple of different ones on the market. The fanciest ones are about 500 bucks. There are some cheaper ones that are about 200 bucks. What, what they are, are, are just uh, small air pumps that plug into 110 volts and um, they pump air through a mechanism that purges the air of moisture. Um, in some of them, it, per, it, it gets pumped through a, a desiccant, uh, a, a chamber full of desiccant crystals. In the case of the Black Max, which is probably the fanciest of these, it actually goes through a, a refrigeration system, kind of like a kind of like a dehumidifier for for a home, and then this dehumidified air gets pumped into the crankcase, and, and it it produces a small positive pressure grad gradient of of, uh, of dried air that forces any moist air out of the engine, out the breather, uh, and it gets replaced by this dried air, so that the engine winds up being dry inside. Those things are extremely effective. Um, and especially if you are, are in a high corrosion risk area, um, you know, Gulf Coast or Florida or something like that, and the engine is flown irregularly, um, having a dehumidifier like that hooked up to the engine when it's not being used is uh, probably the very best thing you can do to defend it against corrosion during periods of disuse. Hmm. Paul is wondering, does removing the oil dipstick after engine shutdown help remove moisture? Um, uh, well, it kind of depends on, on the engine. Usually we remove the oil filler cap, um, but yeah, uh, that helps remove some moisture. If you, if, if you remove the oil filler cap uh, or maybe the dipstick 
in my engine, they're both the same thing. There's a dipstick hooked to the oil filler cap. Um, but if you remove that right after you come in from a flight, you'll notice it's like dripping with water. And a lot of people will remove that after they come in from a flight and leave it off for, for half an hour or something while they're putting the airplane away and transferring their luggage and so on. And and that's helpful. I mean, it's, it's it certainly doesn't purge the engine of moisture, but it helps some of it get out. Um, and you just have to be really careful to put the cap back on because it gets real exciting when you fly with the oil cap off that little bit of oil goes a long way. It makes a real mess. <laughs> Personal don't experience. Ask, don't, don't ask me how I know this. <laughs> <laughs> At least you can laugh about it. <laughs> early, early in my flying career, I I had the experience of leaving a mm. oil cap off of a Cessna 172, and then it, that was an unforgettable experience. I've never done it since. Charles is wondering: Does pulling the prop through do any good for a seldom used engine? No, it does harm. It just, uh, you know, it just accelerates the process of the oil moving from top to bottom. You know, gravity does it enough <laughs> and uh, pulling the prop through just accelerates the process. So that's not a good idea. Jamie's wondering, engine sitting with break-in oil any better or worse than engine sitting with regular oil? Well, um, Depends on what you're using for break-in oil, but a lot, a lot of people use just straight mineral oil for break-in oil that is pretty much devoid of additives. And uh, it's kind of the worst possible oil. I, I don't even like to use that oil for break-in. Um, although it, I mean, think, I think it's, I think people use mineral oil for break-in out of some sort of tradition that predates World War II or something, but I've never seen any uh, uh, any evidence that 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 it's uh, it's better for break-in than than a simple uh, AD oil like uh, Aeroshell W100. Um, we we did a, a webinar on break-in not too long ago, and uh, I, I pointed out you know the two things you want to avoid in break-in oil you, you you don't you don't want it to be a synthetic, uh, and you don't want it to have any scuff additives. But there, to, as far as I can tell, there's no disadvantage of having it be an ashless dispersion oil, regular AD oil, which helps keep the engine clean. And um, a straight mineral oil, uh, you don't want to use it too long because it uh, the sludge will form inside the engine. That's what the AD oil is there to to prevent. Um, so I'm not a big fan of of straight mineral oil. I don't think it really. The, the oil itself would would strip off any faster. It's just that it, it doesn't have, uh, by definition, straight mineral oil doesn't have any uh, any corrosion prevented additives in it, and it would be helpful to to have corrosion prevented add additives if the uh, airplane is uh, is uh, inactive. Jason's wondering, as a general rule of thumb, how long would you allow an engine to sit before it will require pre lubrication? Well, again, that's the uh, it's it's kind of hard to uh, hard hard to answer that question because there are so many variables. But um, I, you know, I would say it, if it if it sits for more than a couple months, for sure, you want to do something like this. Had a couple people ask about the fuel. How how long should you let you know fuel sit before you worry about? you know, replacing that or changing that out? Um, you know, I don't really know an official answer to that. My, it's my impression that, that Avgas has a pretty long shelf life, uh, certainly at least a year uh, before it starts to degrade. But I, I can't give you any a real specific answer to that without researching it. It's, it's a pretty long time. And engine oil has a, even a longer shelf life. It can sit around for, for years without degrading. Mark's wondering, can cam guard also be useful useful for engines that have the cam down low like a Continental? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's why I put it in my engines. My my I've got two two Continentals in my airplane. Um it's it's absolutely helpful for uh for, for really all engines. Larry's wondering, can that cam guard also be used with Aeroshell 15W50, the multi viscosity? 
It could. I don't recommend the use of Aerochel 15W50. Um, for my clients who uh, who need a multi-grade oil because they operate in, in uh, places where it gets cold in the winter, um, I recommend that they use the uh, the Philips uh, XC 20W50 and add CamGuard to it. Um, adding CamGuard to Aerochel wouldn't hurt anything. It's just that I don't like Aerochel to begin with, or the Aerochel 50W50, I mean. I don't like it to begin with. It's it's 50% synthetic oil. We know that synthetic oil doesn't work very well with with uh, uh, with um, leaded fuel. Um, once we start operating on uh, on unleaded avgas, I'm going to be a real big proponent of, of, of uh, using synthetic oils in these engines, but it just doesn't work well with, uh, with leaded fuel. If you happen to be running your engine on um, on um, unleaded auto gas. auto gas, then I withdraw my objection, <laughs> and, mm. and 15W50 would be fine for that. I just don't like using 15W50 in the engines that burn uh, the 100 low lead. Gary's wondering, any comments regarding constant speed props bringing them back to life? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I hadn't really thought about that. The constant speed props, oh, um, the parts of the constant speed prop that are exposed to the engine's oil system uh, are all non-ferrous. They're all uh, they're all aluminum. Um, so we we don't really worry about that kind of corrosion. There there are some steel parts typically inside a constant speed prop. Um, things like torque links and so on, but uh, you, you, you just can't get at them. There's just nothing you can do to, 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 to get to lubrication on those things. So um, I, I, I don't have any words of wisdom as, about what to do with, uh, with propellers. Nathan's we, don't, wondering we, we don't see a lot of problems with propellers. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys are, are, are NTSB report junkies like I am, but I've been reading... NTSB reports in copious quantities for the last many decades. I don't want to count them. And I cannot remember a single general aviation accident uh, caused by a, um, a propeller that, that was over TBO or sat too long or anything like that. I, I can remember one or two uh, uh, turboprop uh, accidents uh, but the the props tend to just be awfully damn reliable <laughs> they, they just don't seem to fail very much a uh, couple requests nathan's wondering if you could turn back to display slide nine he missed his chance to get the screenshot of slide nine let me see if i remember how to do that uh it's one of these hang on i'm working on it here we go. Slide nine. Four, eight. Here's nine. Awesome. <laughs> so let's leave that up here so Nathan can get his screenshot of slide okay, nine. Okay, Nathan. Click, click that little camera. Yeah. After that, Gomer's going to want to see if, uh, is there a way you can go to slide 16 so he can also get a screenshot of slide 16. Okay. I think I can do that. Here's slide 16. We need an instant replay feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not quite there yet. Uh, okay, so David, uh, going on to the next question here, when fogging the cylinders, is it best to fog them before any initial movements of the pistons? Likewise, is it best to fog the crankcase before any turns of the crank? Mm, no, I well, I don't know. You could you could argue that it, it, I think it's it's there's relatively it's relatively irrelevant which which way you do it. I, when you fog the cylinders, I think you, you want to fog each one of them with a piston at bottom dead center so that you can get lubrication on, on the whole length of the combustion chamber. And, and so to do that, you know, you, you're basically forced to turn the propeller for as you move from one cylinder to the next to position 
that piston at bottom dead center. Um, I suppose you could make a technical case that it would be good to fog the, the, the crankcase first, and it certain, certainly wouldn't hurt to do that. I think that, you know, at the very gentle speed that we're turning the prop, it's not going to do any damage regardless of what you do. But I suppose technically one could make an argument for fogging the crankcase first and then doing the combustion chambers. John's wondering, any change in this procedure if you have chrome cylinders? Um, no, except that chrome cylinders um, are basically immune from corrosion. So uh, we really aren't going to worry about the cylinders rusting when you have chrome cylinders. You would probably be mostly worried about the uh, 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 about what's inside the uh, the crankcase. Um, however, chrome cylinders are are run with cast iron rings, which are susceptible to corrosion. So it would definitely be um, a good idea to fog the cylinders, but we're, we're not really worried about corrosion of the cylinder walls with chrome cylinders or nickel plated cylinders for that matter, the, the way we are with conventional steel cylinders. Brian's wondering, is there something specific in an oil analysis that is a telltale warning of spalling? You know, usually cam and lifter spalling won't show up in oil analysis. And the reason is that um, the, the, uh, the metal that is liberated when a cam, uh, cam uh, lobe or a lifter face starts to spall, uh, that metal is too big to make it through the oil filter. So the metal all gets caught in the oil filter and none of it winds up in the sample jar. So it, normally we see nothing in oil analysis when a cam and lifter is coming apart. Well, the place we have to look for that is in, in, in the oil filter inspection. Um, what we do see in oil analysis is very slow wear events that throw off microscopic uh, pieces of metal that, that don't get caught by the filter. Things like accelerated wear of, of valve guides, uh, very, very hard, metal surfaces that come apart in very tiny particles. But cam and lifters, when they come apart, they come apart in fairly good sized pieces. I mean, not, not pebble sized pieces, so you understand, but pieces that are big enough uh, to be caught in the filter and therefore not wind up in the sample jar. Hmm. Hal's wondering if your Lycoming engine was pickled at the factory is there any concern if your build project takes longer than expected and the engine sits around? Well, that's a good question. I, I actually don't know what Lycoming does in terms of, of putting preservative uh, oil and so on in um, engines that they ship from the factory. But if, if indeed they do pickle them, then the engine probably can sit for a good period of time before uh, you, you have to start worrying. Um, and uh, if they ship them with desiccant plugs and so on installed, which I don't, I don't know whether they do or not. Um, it's, I've, I've actually never bought a brand new engine. I've, I always get engines overhauled. So I, I don't really know how the factory ships those engines, but if they ship them with, you know, desiccant plugs installed and pickling oil installed, they can probably sit for a long time without anything bad happening to them. A bunch of people have asked, um, uh, let's just take Jimmy's question here. What items are involved in pickling an engine and how long can pickling preserve an engine? Um, well, both Lycoming and Continental have service bulletins um, outlying, uh, outlining the pickling procedure and they're, they're both pretty much identical. Um, you, you, uh, you do an oil change uh, and you put uh, a special preservative oil in there, and there are a number of different preservative oils. Uh, uh, Shell Fluid 2F is one. Um, Phillips, I believe, makes a, a makes a pickling oil. I forget the 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 designation for it. But you put the oil in the engine, and then you you run the engine with the pickling oil to make sure that everything is very thoroughly coated 
uh, with it. You're actually allowed to fly with pickling oil for a limited period of time um, if you want to. And then uh, once the inside of the engines are coated with the pickling oil, you, you, you shut it down, you pull all the top spark plugs, you put desiccant plugs in there, you put desiccant bags in the, in, in the induction and the exhaust, and you tape it over with duct tape. And that's pretty much it. Um, and with those, um, those steps, the engine can sit for a long time. Periodically, every few months, you should check the desiccant plugs. Um, they, they're clear plastic and they have desiccant crystals inside that are, are, are pink in color. And as the, as the desiccant uh, starts absorbing water, they start to turn blue. So if the, if the, if the pink crystals have turned blue, then you either have to replace the desiccant plugs with new ones, or you have to take the des desiccant plugs home and put them in the microwave oven <laughs> and, uh, and, and make them turn pink again by, by uh, 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 getting rid of the water and then putting them back into the, uh, into the engine. But uh, if you do that, uh, pick, use pickling oil, use desiccant, you, the, the engine can, can be preserved that way for a period of years. Bernard is wondering, how do you find the bottom dead center on each cylinder? Um, well, the, the easiest way, I think, is to just stick a thin, oh, say, piece of piano wire into the spark plug hole, and contact the piston, and then turn the prop, and you'll feel the piston going up and down. And when it's down as low as, it's, as it wants to go, in other words, the wire has gone in as far as it goes, you're at bottom dead center. That's, that's the way I usually do it. Mark's wondering, in your experience, what percentage of event, of engines have you used this method on have been successfully brought back to life without the need for a rebuilt or serious extra work? Oh, well, I, I mean, I don't know that I've done enough of these to create a statistically significant sample. Um, but... Um, uh, I would say the success ratio is quite high. Harry's wondering, my engine is apart, cylinders are removed. I noticed my cylinders have a rust film, very light. Can I use curl or oil and lightly ball hone them? Um, I, 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 I don't think I would do that. If you want to, if you want to hone the cylinders, you should use um, a, a, a regular cylinder hone that uh, that, that will reestablish the uh, crosshatch micro finish on there. I wouldn't use a ball hone on them. Um, I, I would actually rehone them the way they they would be honed uh, during a cylinder overhaul with a with a, a, a cylinder hone that puts a, a crosshatch scratch pattern into the into this into the cylinder. Jeff says Lycomings have an eight inch oil pressure probe port at the front upper half of the engine. Would these be of any benefit for bore scope inspection of the camshaft? Oh boy, I don't know the answer to that without seeing a diagram of the engine to see exactly where that port goes in. I really don't know the answer, I'm sorry. Um, let's see here. John's wondering, an AMP suggested uh, that we use Duralube on a reciprocal engine. Reciprocating, I guess. I, I'm i not familiar with Duralube. I'm sorry, I'd have to look it up. Um, it sounds, it, uh, I, I really I really don't know what it is. I, I need to look it up. John says, some people say to completely fill the crankcase with oil for long-term storage. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I think that's sort of crazy, to <laughs> <laughs> be honest with you. Uh, all right. Um, Gregory's just wondering, um, any comment, how would you modify your procedure for radial engines like a Lacoming R680? 
Mm, I guess I'm, I'm going to have to take the fifth on that because I have extremely limited experience working on radials. Um, uh, certainly the procedure for fogging the cylinders would be the same, but as far as, as accessing um, the, the inside of the crankcase, um, I am, uh, that's above my pay grade. I just don't know uh, the answer on radials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Ed is wondering, can you pre-oil the engine with a pressure pot through a gallery plug until pressure is established? You could. Um, I mean, there are a number of ways you could do that. I, I just, just seems to me it's, uh, it, it's so much easier to just crank the engine with a starter with the spark plugs out that I'm not sure why, um, you know, removing a, a gallery plug, it, it, it just, it just worries me because you, uh, to making sure that the thing is, 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 uh, is put, put back in correctly and is, uh, is oil tight. We, Ran into a engine came up, a rebuilt engine came out of Continental just a couple of weeks ago. That uh, uh, the there were a bunch of gallery plugs that 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 were working loose and apparently hadn't been properly inserted, and the were the right locking compound hadn't been put on them. And I I just would be a little squeamish about doing that, be, given that there's such a an easy way to to pre oil the engine. Uh, with, with its own oil pump. I'm, I'm, I'm just not a big fan of taking stuff apart like that. I assume that wouldn't be considered preventive maintenance either then. Oh, pulling a, pulling a, a gallery plug out of an engine? No, it wouldn't be. Okay. <laughs> For sure. Okay, a um, few people asked, what are your thoughts? Uh, Kurt's asking, what are your thoughts on the uses of all the Avblend product? Oh, that's another question that gets asked all the time on these webinars. Uh, I don't know how we wind up getting into these subjects. We did a test of Avblend years ago uh, when it when it first was released uh, to the aviation market, and we ran some we, we we ran some tests with a couple of twins, where one one of the engines was treated with Avblend, the other one was not treated with Avblend. And we did oil analysis on those engines, and we could never tell a difference. We we, we there was we could find no evidence that that um, there were, there was any reduction in in wear metals or anything like that. Um, having said that, I also have not seen any evidence that uh, Ab Blend hurts anything. So uh, you know, again, if it gives you a, a warm, fuzzy feeling to use it, I wouldn't discourage you from using it. It's just that we've never seen any evidence that it does any good. Hmm. Well, let's try and get a couple more questions in here, Mike. Uh, Walt's wondering: Are there um, are any of the accessories like the vacuum pump prone to damage from non-use? Um. Well, the no, the vacuum pumps, um, they they really don't have a corrosion problem. They 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 uh, they're they're built of non-ferrous metal and a, of graphite. Um, what they have a big problem with is getting any sort of uh, liquid in them. You've got to keep them absolutely bone dry. But um, um, but I, I don't think they have any problem as far as 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 uh, as sitting unused for a period of time i've i've never seen any evidence of that mm -hmm. all right mike well let's wrap it up here um please uh, take a moment share closing comments you want with everybody okay um the usual stuff um i've got two books uh, a little one and a big one <laughs> uh that's that that are available on amazon um, the engines book uh, came out uh, last year at Air Venture. It's 508 pages, and it's it's a very comprehensive uh, book on piston aircraft engines. Um, I'm working on my next two books. It was actually supposed to be my next book, but it it turned out to be a thousand pages long, which is too big to put in paperback. So we divided it into two volumes, and it's on aircraft ownership. covers a, a lot of territory. The first volume, we are trying desperately to uh, 
uh, Get Ready for Air Venture and the second volume we're targeting for Christmas. So um, be on the lookout. And uh, next, uh, next three webinars in this series, um, first Wednesday of every month, the, uh, the one um, in June uh, is called Rush to Judgment. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a story of an of a aircraft owner, a client of ours that put his airplane in the shop to, uh, to get the oil pressure adjusted and they um, immediately tried to sell him a new engine and how we extricated him from that predicament. <laughs> But it's it's just an interesting story uh, about uh, with some lessons for 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 aircraft owners and how they need to, how they should be dealing with uh, with shops. Um, in July, uh, webinar will be a little bit uh, a little bit uh, different one because it's not on the subject of maintenance. It's it's entitled a matter of policy. And it's going to be an air, uh, 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 a webinar all about um, aircraft insurance. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, spend a bunch of quality time with some very senior um, aircraft insurance underwriters, learned a lot of stuff about aircraft insurance that I'm going to be sharing in the July webinar. And then finally, the August webinar, uh, assuming I survive AirVenture. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is titled "I Want to Sue Someone." Uh, one of the uh, one of my my missions in aviation is to reduce the uh, uh, the incidence of lawsuits. And uh, uh, pretty much every week, I get a call from somebody who wants to sue someone and wants my help as an expert witness. I do a fair amount of expert witness work, but I always try to talk them out of the lawsuit. And we'll be talking about. Um, about when it's appropriate to sue someone in aviation and when, and when that's really not a very good idea. And an awful lot of the time, it's not a very good idea. So that's, that's, what, this, that's what the August uh, webinar will be about. And uh, with that, Tim, I am, uh, I'm out of things to say for tonight. All right, Michael. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation, a really good Q&A session. Thank you so much, everybody, for all the, the great questions. I know there yes, are a lot more you. that that did come in and uh, uh, many repetitive type questions. So everybody's question didn't get answered. I apologize if, if your question wasn't specifically answered, but we sure did good. Have a good session tonight. Thank you all so much. And Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight and we'll see you next week, everybody. Have a good night. Good night, everybody.